All right, so what I wanted to do today before your work time is two things. Emphasize actually the examples from last Friday, the Hamiltonian gradient system, in the context of something new called the Lyapunov function. And then give you a little intro to Laplace transforms, even though it doesn't come up in the lectures until lecture 34, I believe. Okay, so a little intro would never hurt though. So let's look at the examples from last time, the Mathematica notebook in particular. That's not it. This is actually the one that I shared with you a few hours ago. This is what we went through last Friday, Hamiltonian and gradient system. Let's quickly review. and then show you some new things. We'll focus on example one. So this was our Hamiltonian function, a function of two variables, X and Y, that you can think about without thinking about differential equations. You can just think of this as a multivariable calculus function that, for example, you might wanna graph and you might wanna optimize. You might, you know, maybe it has an application where you wanna find the lowest possible output here. So you could, find partial derivatives with respect to X and Y, set them equal to zero to solve for critical points and then try to cl classify those critical points. And for example, right about here somewhere, there would be a, a minimum. There's a low point there on the graph. And also over here, there's a minimum. There's two low points. There's like a local maximum right about here. You see there's like a little hill there. Can I see that right there? And then there are saddle points. And you can talk about saddle points in multivariable calculus without talking about differential equations. And they do look kind of like saddles. If you can imagine sitting kind of right there with your legs going this way, this would be like a saddle that you might be sitting on, not the entire graph, but just part of it right there. It'd be a saddle point in that it's not a low, it's a critical point. The partial with of derivative with respect to X is zero there. If you imagine slicing this graph right where my cursor is showing, in the X direction, there'd be like a local max. And in the Y direction, if you go this way, it's like it's a local min. It's both a local max and a local min at the same time in a sense. And that's what makes a saddle point. And really what that means is, is it's neither a local max or nor, nor a local min in the big scheme of things. But relating this to differential equations, we can use this function to create vector fields. The vector field where the first component is the partial with respect to y, and the second component is the opposite of the partial with respect to x is a vector field that's gonna define a Hamiltonian system. There it is. When we use stream plot, we are plotting that vector field effectively and the solution curves that follow the vector field. The first component we call little f, the second component we call little g as usual. And then all this stuff makes a picture of the phase plane. And yeah, this would be, I mean, you, you practiced for about 15 minutes last Friday trying to draw this by hand, but you know, it's hard to do a very good job. It really is something where technology is ideal and the Hamiltonian system problem from last year's final, I believe I at least gave them the null coins. Maybe I also gave them the level curves of the Hamiltonian function. I don't remember offhand, I, I think I did. And the main conceptual point is if you're drawing this by hand and if you've got the level curves that you see in the background there, you'd wanna draw arrows on top of those curves, indicating that the curves themselves become solution curves. Gotta be careful when you think about that though. When I say the curves themselves, I don't mean just the X, Y coordinates. I mean, functions of T, parametric curves, x of t comma y of t that trace those geometric curves out as time goes by. They are solution curves of differential equations and you've got to draw arrows on top of them. And sometimes they move faster and sometimes they move slower. In fact, they're going to move slower typically near equilibrium points and faster than in, when they're further away from equilibrium. And with Hamiltonian systems is very special. Equilibrium points are either always centers or saddle points, you never get sinks or sources, whether they spiral or not. In two dimensions, you always get 
either centers or saddle points because the level curves have to come back to where they started. Jacobian matrix can be used. And certainly for the saddle points, the eigenvalues, you have one positive, one negative. And so that technically that hartman grobman theorem applies. And when I say that applies, I, I, it's not that you're gonna have to state it on the exam or anything like that. The hartman grobman theorem is just a, a way of formalizing the intuitive idea of linearization. The book takes a more intuitive approach, right? The vector field looks similar for the linearized system near the equilibrium point in the case where your eigenvalues have non-zero real part. So if they're real numbers, neither of them is zero. And if they're complex numbers, they're not purely imaginary. Technically at the centers, you get purely imaginary eigenvalues, which means technically hartman grobman doesn't apply. Linearization can fail, although because the system's Hamiltonian, it happens to work anyway. If you create another vector field, a related one, where the first component is the partial of H with respect to X, not Y, and the second is partial with respect to Y, not the opposite of the one with respect to X, it's a related vector field, it's a gradient vector field because this is a gradient vector. This is how you, if you take multivariable calculus, you learn about gradient vectors of a function. That's a vector field when the first component is the partial with respect to the first variable and the second component is the partial with respect to the second variable. This is called a gradient vector and it creates a gradient vector field. And we can see solution curves are still related to the level curves of H. They don't follow the level curves of H, they're perpendicular to them. We say orthogonal to them. Some people say normal to them. Orthogonal is probably the best word to use. Anytime one of these solution curves crosses this level curve of H, it's gotta be perpendicular to it. You can get saddle points, these three points, upper right, lower right, and middle left are saddle points. You can get sinks and sources, though they're never spiral sinks or spiral sources. You can't get centers with gradient systems. In this plot, I plotted both systems solution curves at the same time, just for fun. They're orthogonal to each other. These are sometimes called orthogonal trajectories. Here's something else important to realize, though I had to use ND solve to realize it. I haven't emphasized ND solve with you guys. I did a little bit more last year. You had a video where I talked about it, but ND solve is a way to get Mathematica to numerically approximate solutions in a way that's better than Euler's method. But using it's kind of it's tricky. You always have to look for examples. And even when you look at the examples, it gets tricky. But I was able to use it here. And what I've got right here is a closer in view of the Hamiltonian function along with a solution curve to the Hamiltonian system based on a certain initial condition. Actually, my initial condition was the origin. Wait a minute. How could this be the solution of the Hamiltonian system? Aren't those these things? Aren't these the solution? Yeah, they are. And the, the one through the origin, the origin's right about there. By the way, this little error here must be numerical error. There's no sideways error that should be there. The one that starts at the origin should go around like this and come back to the origin. Should be a periodic solution. This picture is that solution curve if you rotate this graph, like this, rotate it so you're looking straight down on it. Now it looks like the solution curve I was drawing by hand. Question? So is the initial, is the um, additional dimension 
Um, no, it's not, but that's a good guess. The initial, the additional dimension here is the, the output of the Hamiltonian function effectively. And so what this is, is this is showing the solution curve in a horizontal plane where the output of the Hamiltonian function is zero because H of zero, zero equals zero. But if I change my initial condition, watch what happens here. I increase X zero, for example, the graph doesn't stay in the same horizontal plane. Now X zero is 0.395 to this picture here. What's H of 0 0.3950? It's 1.12. The second coordinate of all the points on that graph right there are 1.12. What this is illustrating is I'm plotting the curve along with a third coordinate that represents the effectively the total energy, kinetic plus potential. And it's the fact that these are on horizontal planes is both illustrating that why they're on the level curves in the other picture, because the level curves are made by slicing this graph with horizontal planes. And also showing that the energy is staying constant because the, the last coordinate doesn't change. Does that make sense? Can I clarify anything about that? I mean, I, that's a pretty advanced concept. I can also change the Y coordinate and get other, again, I, on, I'm on other level curves of H, but I can always recover the original solution curve by looking straight down on it. It's just, a, it's just a way of visualizing it. So that's kind of neat and illustrates the point that H stays constant. That's the purpose. Another thing you can do is you can graph the gradient system solution curves on top of the same function. H is no longer a Hamiltonian system for the gradient system. It's called a potential function. I can still call it H though. In lectures I typically call it B. For the gradient system, solutions go uphill instead of staying constant values of H, they go uphill, they go steepest descent, it's what it's called. If you started on this graph, imagining this to be like a hilly region in some mountainous area, you started right there and you wanted to go the upward, the fastest route, you actually would follow this curve. The solution curve looking at it like this, starting here and going up toward the equilibrium points there, would be a solution curve for the gradient system. It would be approximately, um, let's see, it's the initial condition zero, zero here. It, hmm, okay, I think because of numerical error, it's not exactly following the solution curve that goes toward this point. It, it should have, unless I'm just not looking at it right. It actually seems to be going toward the saddle point instead of this local maximum. It really, if I'm starting truly at the origin, it really should go to, toward this point. I think possibly because of numerical error, it's going up toward, toward the saddle point. That might be the reason. If I increase Y zero a little bit, it's gonna go somewhere else. Hmm, it's not. Oh, there's a mistake here. This should be inaccurate. Let me re-enter this. Okay, now it's going toward the maximum. This is correct, okay. But if I change the initial value of Y, it's still going toward that maximum because that's a sink. In this picture here, you'd have to have an initial condition way up here before you go off this way. You, you start up here somewhere, you're still gonna go toward that sink which corresponds to a local maximum value of H. So solutions in effect go uphill with gradient systems. What's a Lyapunov function? A Lyapunov function, well, they will always exist for gradient systems, but they even exist sometimes for non-gradient systems. They are functions along which solution curves always go downhill instead of uphill. In fact, I could modify this graph 
with a gradient system, if I graph not the, grade, the uh, potential function itself, but it's opposite, put a negative sign in front of this. I'll also put a negative sign here. It's effectively the same picture, except that three-dimensional surface graph gets flipped upside down. Because I'm putting a negative in front of all the outputs of H. And then solutions would go downhill for the corresponding gradient system. So now the picture looks like this. And now solutions are going downhill. So this, this point with the initial condition at the origin is going downhill toward this valley here. And that jives better with calling that point a sink. If you think of it as going downhill. It's just a little bit more intuitive way to think about it. And yeah, that function negative H is what's called a Lyapunov function. If I will go ahead and call it H here, call it V in the lectures. If H of X, Y say is a potential function, not a Hamiltonian function for a gradient system, In fact, that gradient system would be dx dt is partial of h with respect to x and dy dt is partial of h with respect to y. Then the function negative h of x, y, which maybe I could give a new name and call it L of x, y, so Lyapunov, is what's called a Lyapunov function for the system. That system. But what does that mean? Intuitively, it means solutions go downhill if you graph them like I just showed you on top of the graph of L, negative H. How do you verify that? along a solution curve. X of T comma Y of T, the derivative of L evaluated along that curve, that solution curve is gonna turn out to always be less than or equal to zero. When the derivative of some function of t is always less than or equal to zero, that means the function is decreasing. It's going down in value. If L represented energy, energy, kinetic energy, say, it would be dissipating. It's a dissipative system. How do you verify that this is true, though? You need the multivariable calculus chain rule which I'm not going to prove, but it says that this derivative would be the partial of L with respect to X times dx dt plus the partial of L with respect to Y times dy dt, which by the way, could be thought of as a dot product of two vectors. Maybe it's worth writing what dot product that would be. would be the gradient vector of L dotted with the velocity vector of a solution curve. I could write that like this. This would be the capital Y vector dt if I, I like. Anyway, we're supposed to show this is negative. How? Well, you got to use what the system is. You got to use this fact up here. That must be relevant, otherwise it might, probably is not going to be true. But this would be negative. And L is negative H. So in fact, this gradient vector is the opposite of the gradient vector of H. And I could, I could write all this in terms of derivatives of H. DL dx would be negative DH dx. L equals negative H. 
And dx dt, well, it's dh dx. So I really get negative dh dx squared there. And a similar thing happens with the other derivatives. You get negative dh dy times dy dt, but what is dy dt? It's dh dy again. This is minus dh dy squared. And this is certainly a quantity that when we're dealing with real numbers is never positive. This is always less than or equal to zero. You don't see any t's in here except at the beginning. The t's are implicitly there. You don't, we just don't bother writing them. Everything ultimately does depend on t when you're differentiating along the solution curve. This is ultimately a derivative with respect to t. And we're saying it's always less than or equal to zero. That means the values of L, in other words, negative H, are going down over time along solution curves, which is a symbolic way of verifying what we see in the picture here. Where'd it go? And it doesn't matter what initial condition I start at. The solution curve is still going downhill on this Lyapunov function. Uh, you get errors if you go too far because what's happening is the solution is going down so fast, it's effectively going to infinity in finite time. And so it's, it's giving errors, but don't worry about it. Okay. So more examples, more details in the lectures. This is a pretty important kind of thing. You also learn in the lectures, Lyapunov functions can be used to make trapping regions. Like in the extra readings I gave you, second one. And that's coming up in the lectures. And trapping regions can be used to prove in certain situations that periodic solutions exist. Something called the Poincare Van Dixon theorem. That's a preview of some things you should look for in the lectures. Um, Let's also do an example to get you warmed up to start thinking about Laplace transforms. So the, you're not going to watch this video until ideally tomorrow sometime, but um, not a bad idea to get you warmed up. What is the Laplace transform? The main subject of chapter six in our main book. What's the big picture of what's going on with it? It's gonna feel very different than everything else we've done to this point. It is a method for solving differential equations. In the most ideal setting, the differential equations that we solve are forced harmonic oscillators. When you're dealing with more basic forced harmonic oscillators, using the Laplace transform seems kind of silly because it makes the problem harder. You can still do it, but it's harder. However, it is ultimately more flexible than the other methods that we talked about. And because of that flexibility, it allows you to solve a wider class of problems including where the fun forcing function is something weird, like maybe a discontinuous forcing function. Like you got the mass on the spring going back and forth, try hitting it with a hammer. Effectively hitting a mass on a spring with a hammer is like a discontinuous forcing. You're essentially hitting it at effectively one moment in time. Now, technically speaking, it's not, that's not true, right? You hit it with a hammer, it, the hammer is going to be in contact with the mass over some tiny amount of time that's measurable. But from a mathematical modeling standpoint, it's actually easier to model it as a discontinuous forcing that you're actually hitting it with just one moment in time. And Laplace transforms in that kind of situation work much better than any other method. Okay. We're not going to get far enough into chapter six to fully see that. 
but uh, if you're desiring some math to do over Christmas break, that's something you could do. Okay, probably not over Christmas break, but at some point before math methods, it might be good to look at. Okay, and I did make an extra thirty-seven lecture thirty-seven that we will not, I will not require you to watch, where I do get into more detail about that and expand on that if you don't feel like reading about it. But that's not going to be required for the for our course. Here's the definition of Laplace transform. It is a transform. It is a transformation. In fact, it is a linear transformation, linear algebra. But it's unlike any linear transformation you've ever seen before. It takes a function, a y of t, and gives you another function commonly called capital Y of S, say, This capital Y is not a vector though. It's just the common letter to use here. And it's defined to be an integral, an improper integral in fact, from zero to infinity of the function little y of t times an exponential decay that depends on s, e to the negative s t integrate with respect to t. When you do this integral, you want to think of S as fixed. But different S's will give you different values. And so ultimately, the answer does depend on S. You can think of capital Y as a function of S. Make sense conceptually? Do the integral, pretend S is constant. But then once you've done that, the answer do, does depend on S and you can change your perspective and think of S as a variable. Here's an example. What is capital Y of S when little y of T is the function little t? It would be the improper integral from zero to infinity of little t times e to the negative S T dt, which can be done using integration by parts. Say U equals T, du equals dt, db is e to the negative st dt, or if you prefer, you could write that as d prime equals e to the negative st. And v is negative one over s e to the negative st. That's just the integration by parts stuff that you've done for a little while since Calc 2. And the integration by parts formula says you're going to get u times v. That'll be the product of these two things. Negative T over S, E to the negative S T. T goes from zero to infinity. Good to emphasize the T here. Minus the integral of V times DU. And with respect to that integral, remember S is fixed. And so this negative one over S can be factored out in front as a positive one over S because the two negative signs make a positive. Technically speaking, improper integrals are really limits, but we're being a little bit hand wavy here. If you plug in infinity for t here, and I don't mean literally plug in infinity, I mean take a limit as t goes to infinity. The fact that, well, okay, what is, what is the value of s? Is it assumed to be positive? <clears throat> it would have to be if this integral is going to converge, actually. So assuming s is positive, e to the negative infinity, because s is positive, negative s is negative, is zero really the limit of that is zero. And it doesn't matter that you have a T in front either. Exponential decay goes to zero a lot faster than linear growth goes to infinity. And when you plug in T equals zero there, in particular, you get zero. This entire thing becomes zero if S is positive, which is what we need to assume to finish this problem. What does this thing become? This thing becomes negative one over s squared e to the negative st 
T gets evaluated from zero to infinity. Once again, if you quote unquote plug in zero for T, assuming S is positive, you get E to the negative infinity, you get zero. And then if you plug in T equals zero, you don't get zero, you get ultimately positive one over S squared. Try to finish this up in five minutes or so you have more time. What in the world, what's this all about? Trying to get there. So far, this is just an example of computing the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of the function t is the function one over s squared. In doing the calculation, we pretended s was fixed, but in ending it, we say, hey, what if s is a variable? Then I get a different number there. Hey, I could call that a function of s. Assuming s is positive. Technically, when s is not positive, the, this calculation is junk because these things don't go to zero. All right, what is, the, what is this all for? Let's just add to the Mathematica here. Mathematica can certainly compute Laplace transforms. If I type Laplace transform T, I think the syntax is comma t comma s. I believe maybe I should double check that. Well, okay. Do we get one over s squared? Yes, we do. I think that is the correct syntax to use. Yeah, you put your function, whatever your function is of t right there. Then the, the next T is to emphasize that, hey, T is the variable for that function. And then the final S is to emphasize you want your answer to depend on S, which is traditional. If I wanted my answer to depend on R, then the answer would be one over R squared. Mathematica doesn't care, but traditionally we allow the answer to depend on S. If I have an A in here, the fact that I have a T here emphasizes that T is the variable, not A. The answer does depend on that. All right, what's all this for? Laplace transforms, one application of them is to solve differential equations. How is this related to differential equations? Let's take a first order differential equation. dy dt plus 4y equals t. So that would be a first order forced equation. Feels a little silly to call that a forced equation because you think forced equations should always be second order with second derivatives because otherwise, how is accelerate f equals ma going to be used? Well, I guess if y were velocity instead of position, this still could be used with f equals ma, possibly. This is like a chapter one problem. This is like a problem where, for example, we use integrating factors to solve it, or method of undetermined coefficients with a yh and a yp. The yh. If you consider the corresponding homogeneous system equation would be dy dt equals negative four y. This is not equivalent to the equation. This is the corresponding homogeneous equation. And that tells me y h is an arbitrary constant times e to the negative four t, right? Solution of that, which we've done a lot. This is the thing that leads to the beautiful generalization when we change the number there to a matrix and change the vector, the, the quantity y to a vector. 
C is arbitrary, why P, a particular solution of the non-homogeneous, I need to guess something. And since the right-hand side is a T, a good guess would be A T plus B say, but we do need to solve for capital A and capital B. We've done this before. Y prime, Y P prime plus four Y P would be A T plus B. Oops, no, that's a mistake. A is the derivative of Y P. Four times YP is four times in parentheses AT plus B. Gather like terms. This becomes four AT, and then the constant term is A plus four B. If I set this equal to the right hand side function T, that gives me a system of equations in A and B. Four A must equal one, and A plus four B must equal zero. If these are going to be true, equal for all T. This means A is one fourth, and plugging in here means B negative one fourth A is going to be negative one sixteenth. So Y P ultimately is going to equal one fourth T plus one sixteenth or mi minus one sixteenth. Sorry. Minus one sixteenth, and then if I add initial condition, this is taking a little longer than five minutes. Like y of zero equals two, my general solution is y h plus y p. If I use the initial condition, I'm going to get c plus zero minus one sixteenth. It looks like the c. It's going to be 33 sixteenths. So the initial value problem solution is going to be 33 sixteenths T. Oh no, e to the e to the negative 4T plus one fourth T minus one sixteenth. Let's see if that really is right. Where's Mathematica? I have not made a mistake. So I'm going to use dsolve here. Hang on. I'm just trying to see the main point of all this. dsolve y prime of t plus 4y of t equals equals t, y of 0 equals 2. Did we get the same answer? Yes, looks like we did. Wait, we're talking about Laplace transforms. How is that relevant? What we end up doing with Laplace transforms is we take the Laplace transform of both sides of the differential equation. Where T is the variable and get an answer that depends on S. And you get this weird looking expression, which we can algebraically solve For the Laplace transform of y, this is an algebraic equation that we can solve for the unknown Laplace transform. y of zero equals two, I can replace this y of zero with two. And then what I can do is take what's called the inverse Laplace transform of this thing when I replace y of zero with two, because that's what it was. And what happens is I get the same answer. Okay, there's a lot of details that are going under the rug here. We're relying on the technology to do it for us. But pic big picture is we're solving the differential equation with the Laplace transform. <coughs> we are taking the Laplace transform on both sides of the equation. Somehow we are algebraically solving what results for that unknown Laplace transform. I did that with solve here. This is an algebraic equation to solve for this unknown Laplace transform. I get this. I can replace y of zero with the initial condition two and do the inverse Laplace transform and get the exact same solution. 
that I got up here with diesel. All I want to get across here is the big picture, even though we have to fill in some details. Okay, so that's what ideally you'll be learning about with lecture 30 or ideally watching it tomorrow sometime. Okay, you've got about 20 minutes to work.